So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the third primary framework that's in Java, modern Java for supporting parallel processing. So we've talked about sequential and parallel streams. That's one framework. We've talked about fork join pool. That's the second framework. And now we're going to talk about completable futures, which is the third and, and final framework that we're going to cover in this class. To start off the discussion, we're going to focus first on the relationship between so-called reactive programming and Java completable futures. And you'll see that they have some things in common. They're not entirely identical. There's some additional stuff in Java that goes a little further to provide reactive programming support to Java. But this is a good down payment in the direction of reactive programming. So first and foremost, what the heck is reactive programming? So reactive programming is a relatively recent paradigm. It's actually been a long, around for a long time. But uh, in recent years, it's become very popular. And it's an asynchronous programming paradigm that's concerned with processing data streams and propagating changes. So you process stuff and you propagate the changes. And as the name sort of implies, it's, it's reactive. You're waiting for stuff to happen, and you're doing it asynchronously. And when things are done, you do some more stuff in response to what just finished. There are four key principles in reactive programming. And if you want to learn more about these principles, take a look at the so-called reactive manifesto. These days, if you want to, uh, to make your mark, you have to have a manifesto. right? So we've, we had the Communist Manifesto. We had the GNU Manifesto. We have the Reactive Manifesto. But the only thing that's more likely to catch your attention than a manifesto is something considered harmful. So go to considered harmful, right? Mm -hmm. Reactive programming considered harmful. They'll, they'll write something about that. Singleton pattern considered harmful. So these are ways of trying to capture people's attention. So there are four key principles in reactive programming. Principle number one is responsive. And the idea there is you want to be able to provide rapid and consistent response times to the end users. You don't want to have the dreaded hourglass or the dreaded spinning wheel or, or whatever iconography is used by operating systems to indicate something's taking a long time to run. Uh, this happens a lot less than it used to, but you still get them sometimes, especially for long running operations that aren't properly programmed to take advantage of background threads and parallel processing. So the idea here is to establish reliable upper bounds to give the users a consistent quality of service and to prevent undue delays. Now, obviously, if it takes a while to get a result, it takes a while to get a result. But you don't want to block things. You want to be as responsive as you can. Another thing you want to be able to do if you're being reactive is you want to be resilient. And this basically means that the system will remain responsive even if something fails. Now, obviously, if you know, somebody, uh, if, if somebody runs over your computer with a, with a steamroller, it may not be resilient. Although if you're really into resilience, you'll have a backup server running elsewhere, right? So um, people who run things like Amazon Cloud and so on try very, very hard to avoid complete failure. But the point is, if you have a partial failure, if one operation fails, you don't want that to have the domino effect of taking everything down. So in the context of what we're discussing here, resilience really means the whole system doesn't fail when a piece of it fails. So we want to be able to tolerate partial failure. That's, that's what resilience means in this context. It doesn't mean going to heroic measures to have redundancy and so on in every part of the system. The third reactive programming principle is elastic or elasticity. And the idea here is that the system should remain responsive, which was our first principle, even under varying workload. And, and really what that means is, I mean, obviously, if workload's going down, it's pretty likely the system will be responsive. But the more interesting question is, as the workload goes up, what happens to the system? Does it start to degrade? How do you auto-scale it? And this, of course, is something that's becoming popular and possible now that we have cloud-based computing where you can add more computing resources, perhaps by paying a little bit extra money, but you're able to scale your system up gracefully. So you might say, I'll allocate you know, 50 cores under normal operation, so I'll, I'll pay for 50 cores. But 
if a lot of users show up, because maybe I'm running some kind of a promotion, or maybe I'm running the Olympics website, or maybe there's a, you know, a, a cat catastrophic disaster and everybody's on the website, you know, on the web, trying to search to find out what's happening. I want my system to automatically auto scale so that I can have more processing. And that's why I kind of like this, this uh, picture here, right? We're jumping from smaller fish bowls into bigger ones as demand increases. And this, again, is really only possible now that we have elastic hardware infrastructure like clouds and elastic software infrastructure like load balancing and dynamic auto scaling and so on to help compensate as things improve. And then the, the fourth principle, which is kind of a little different from the other three. The other three are really in terms of these properties, right? Responsive, resilient, elastic. Message driven is really more sort of an implementation detail. It's more about the architecture that's used to communicate between the various elements. And the idea here is that you want to have asynchronous message passing used in order to enhance loose coupling, isolation, and location transparency between components. You don't really want to know or care where the thing is run. You don't care if it runs on this core. You don't want to care if it runs on that core. You just want to pass messages around. And whoever's got a spare cycle will pick it up and do something with it. Not unlike our discussion of work stealing, in fact. In fact, if you think about what's going on with work stealing, you have these tasks, which are messages. They're, they're really objects, but they're treated as messages that are put on queues. And then the threads in the worker, the worker threads in the fork joint pool will reach out and sort of you know, try to grab those things off the end of the queues. So that's a good example of message driven. So that's, that property is a little bit more of an implementation detail, but the other three are really core quality attributes, responsive, resilient, and elastic. So with that as sort of a quick overview of the key principles or tenets of reactive programming, let's talk about how Java Completable Futures map onto that. Now, I, I realize I haven't said anything about what a completable future is at this point. Um, so a completable future is basically an operation that can run asynchronously in the background. And when it's done, it'll let you know it's finished. So you can do something else. So that's a completable future in a nutshell. We'll talk a lot more about it later. We've, we have, I briefly described it in some of the earlier introduction videos in the course, but this is just a quick synopsis, and then we'll get into this more detail. So Java completable futures map onto reactive programming principles in a number of ways. First, they are responsive. What does that mean? They don't block user code. So I guess that what I really should say is um, they don't block the main thread of the user code. And the reason why we don't want to block the user code, the main thread of the user code, is whenever you do blocking operations in the user thread, that ends up underutilizing the cores, it impedes the inherent parallelism available in modern multi-core machines, and it complicates the program structure. So we don't want to be blocking. And you can see some examples in this article that talk about why you don't want to block. The way this works in completable futures is they've got these really cool features. They have factory methods, which start tasks running asynchronously, start operations running asynchronously. You have things called completion stage message methods, which wait for things to finish and then do something in response. And then there's also something called arbitrary arity methods, which wait for many things to finish, either one of them or all of them. And these are all different techniques, different methods that are provided by the completion framework, the, the completable future framework, to avoid blocking threads. We don't want to block stuff. That's a bad thing. It makes it non-responsive. Another thing we sometimes don't want to do, but sometimes we do, is we want to avoid changing threads unnecessarily. And the reason for this is whenever you change threads, you run the risk of incurring overhead. You end up with the need to synchronize, to coordinate when you're going to change from one thread to another. You may end up with context switching to shut one thread down and start another thread up. There may be overhead in terms of memory and cache management to move data between threads, between cores, and so on. And so if you're not careful, if you change threads unnecessarily, you may end up having slower performance, even though you're using more threads, which seems a little bit counterintuitive. But in reality, there's a cost that comes from moving from one thing to another. So the Completable Futures framework gives you the option of managing these kinds of things.
And that is done with the fork join pool. And there are various methods in the fork join, uh, sorry, in the computable futures framework, which we'll talk about shortly. They're called the non-async methods. And any of the non-async methods don't change threads. They do the next computation in the current thread, in the calling thread, or the completing thread. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. So don't block user code, don't change threads. That helps to make the system more responsive. How do we make the system more resilient? Well, the idea here is to make sure that if something fails, the whole system doesn't come crashing down. And as we'll see in this particular case, completable futures like parallel streams, like the fork join pool, all run within a single process, not a cluster. If you want cluster-based technologies, you need to move to other middleware like Hadoop, for example, or Sparks that do scheduling of tasks in clusters in multiple computers as opposed to multiple cores on a single computer. <clears throat> and the way that this is done, uh, the way resilience is done is through exception handling. So exceptions are used to make sure that if something goes wrong in one thread, it doesn't percolate to the entire program and cause the whole thing to shut down. And then the third property that we're going to talk about here that's mapping completable futures onto reactive programming is elasticity. So asynchronous computations can run in a pool of threads atop a set of cores. And this could be a custom fork join pool. It could be the common fork join pool, whatever fork join pool you want. So unlike parallel streams, which required the common fork join pool, unlike the fork join pool framework, which required a fork join <laughs> pool, obviously, um, we'll say that completable futures has more options. You can use other thread pools besides fork join pools or the common fork join pool. By default, you get the common fork join pool. But if you don't want that one, you can choose a different thread pool. And then the, the fourth and final principle here is this message-driven property where internally the Java fork join pool passes messages between the threads and implements work stealing. And that's how it moves the things back and forth. So it gives some of those properties of loose coupling, isolation, location transparent, where location means core, not computer, and so on and so forth. So that's a, a quick, quick mapping onto Java completable futures. Now there's another framework that's in later versions of Java, namely in Java 9, called reactive streams. And as reactive streams, as the name reactive streams implies, this is much closer to the true meaning of reactive programming as set forth in the reactive manifesto. And this is done with something called the flow API. And this particular approach adds support to Java for stream-oriented publisher-subscriber patterns. And so what you do is you can have publishers, well, you have subscribers that say, here's what I'm willing to accept. Send me, you know, 20 items in one fell swoop. And then the publisher will send the items to the subscriber. So the subscriber controls what the publisher, when and what conditions the publisher publishes under, and then the publisher sends the items to the subscriber. And of course, what's interesting about this is you can put a bunch of um, mapping operations and filter operations between publishers and subscribers to transform the data and to filter it and so on. There are two patterns that are applied here, two patterns that you're probably familiar with if you remember the CS251 course, if you took it here, one of which is the iterator pattern where you pull items from the publisher, the subscriber pulls the items from the publisher, and then the observer pattern, which has a push model where the publisher publishes things when it receives it from some source and it sends it on to the subscriber to be processed in some way. And this reactive streams framework and the so-called flow API is a very peculiar addition to Java because really it's just a bunch of interfaces. And if you want to program with it, you either have to implement those interfaces yourself or more likely you leverage an existing reactive programming framework like RxJava or Akka, which provides you with wrappers 
around these interfaces to give you the full-blown reactive programming model. We're not going to talk any further about these other frameworks, but they're quite interesting and, and very powerful. Um, the main difference between a framework like the uh, RxJava framework and something like, say, Streams, is that RxJava is a push-driven framework. It pushes the events out to the subscribers from the publishers. Whereas the Streams model is a pull-based model. When the terminal operation is reached, it pulls the data from the source through the pipeline of transformations to, to map and filter and so on. And here's a little diagram that tries to put this all in perspective. So the dimensions here are synchronous and asynchronous and single value and multiple value. Those are the dimensions on the x and y axis. So synchronous just means you make a method call, you block waiting for the result. So obviously, just a good old-fashioned Java object, the things that you would have learned in CS101 here, that's synchronous single return value. We all understand that. Completable futures are asynchronous single value. You invoke an asynchronous operation. You go ahead and, and use a factor method to start it in motion. It runs asynchronously, and when it completes, it gives you a single result back. So that's what a completable future does. Likewise, if you look up here, synchronous multiple values would be something like streams or parallel streams where the calls are synchronous, they block, but you could use a, a parallel stream to have multiple things running in parallel. And there's a stream, so there's multiple values involved. And then the final piece of the puzzle is asynchronous multiple values, which would either be reactive streams or a combination of sequential streams plus completable futures. So these things here on the right-hand side are what we would consider reactive programming. And the stuff up at the top is really the full-fledged, full-blown reactive programming where we've got asynchronous operations with multiple values. And as you can see, completable futures is kind of a, a hybrid approach there. It can either have a single value, or if you combine it with a sequential stream, you can have multiple values. So this is just kind of putting all this discussion into a context. I guarantee you this will make more sense as we talk further about completable futures. So. Um, I just put it here because everybody's excited about reactive programming, but, but in reality, I probably should move this a little bit later after we've talked about the completable futures framework so it kind of fits more to what you understand it to be 